I do the things that I do when your mama blow. Like the baby daddy and Eddie ain't grown enough. I want to my baby grow up alone in a mama house. Just a bitch writing these rhymes. I never like it. I rhymes. I rhyme harder and harder while flipping niggas for times. Ain't she back in my exes. So back back home to and love making heaven. I'll be ending up and hope that I make it to heaven. Seven matches. Seven now my mama became a river. Now my mama house is so every I got new goals. Got new bitches. Yeah, bet the brothers start calling my women bitches. Red gold, green gold, gang do it right. And we never do it wrong for your niggas. Yeah, bet that day.
Hallelujah. Wow, full house, beautiful faces. So glad to be here on this beautiful evening. We have an amazing night uh, lined up for you. Uh, my name is Anjali. I am your MC for the evening. Uh, but before we get to anything else, today is National Indigenous Peoples Day. Perfect that it landed on this day. Uh, today is a day to celebrate, to share, to remember and to reflect and for settlers on this land, it's a time to continue the process of questioning our relationship to these lands and our allyship with the people who have called it home since time immemorial. And today we are able to gather on Musqueam land. And uh, before we kick off our event, we are very blessed to have Reuben George uh, with us here to acknowledge the territory that we are on. And if you don't know, Reuben George is from tsleil Nation. Uh, he is the Sundance chief, and he is a uh, very powerful uh, leader in the movement for, uh, for climate justice on these lands. He is a longtime spokesperson for the tsleil -Waututh Sacred Trust Initiative, um, and he's working with indigenous law and traditional principles to put an end to the Kinder Morgan pipeline, or that's what Sacred Trust was doing, and to steward the Burrard Inlet. Um, so without further ado, please give a very warm welcome to Reuben George, my friend. <laughs> ACM, Hoichka CM, Hoichka CM. I feel a little bit weird up here. <laughs> but, uh, happy Aboriginal Day. You know, um, you know how far we have come as Tisleewutu Nation from 13 people, from 15,000 wiped out to 13 people to, to survive in residential school, to survive in the gen genocide. You know when you owned a business, it was against the law to sell half the goods in the First Nation business compared to anyone else in Canada owning a business. When the Kinder Morgan Pipeline was built, you couldn't even speak to a lawyer. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of things. It's against the law to speak our language, to to um, practice our culture, to sing our songs, and, and to celebrate with you Aboriginal Day and to get applause like that is, is part of the reconciliation that my people need, so thank you. You know, com coming from a long way, um, Tisleewutu Nation, like the rest of Canada, was suffering from, from those effects of residential school and, and uh, all those things that I spoke on, and, and um, I, I grew up through those hard times. It was when I was young, it was like 99% of the people drank and the homes were broken and there's abuse and there's a whole bunch of things that were going on that weren't right, that were learned from uh, the Canadian government and some of the churches. And um, so when my Uncle Len became chief, that was about 30 years ago, uh, our employment rate was about 80%. And then now there's at one point about five years ago, when I was director of community development, our employment rate was zero. We've been hovering around 5%. When the first ceremonies came back to our community about 30 years ago, about 80% of the people quit drinking, and it's still been hovering around that right now. Um, and, and we've grown a lot. When we started to grow a lot, what, what ended up happening is we picked up those tools of our culture and our spirituality, and we started using those. Those are the lands of the water, those are the lands that the earth teaches you, the animals teach you, and we, we started to try to apply those things to our community. And that's what we did essentially to be Kinder Morgan. You know, we had a 1,200-page assessment done based on Tisleewutu Nation law. We, we did an economic study that proven, and we, did, we re revamped it a bit. It's, it's, it's not $9 billion, it's $11.8 billion that it's going to cost to fix this monstrosity that's, that's happening. We, we did a spill analysis, we did a cleanup analysis, we just finished an air quality study, and we're doing a health study, all within Tisleewutu Nation law. Any, anybody building in, in our traditional territory needs a permit. We do 500 referrals a year of people wanting to build in their territory. Our environmental assessment is more strict than any municipal and federal 
and provincial government. We do a cultural assessment. We do a dig to make sure there's no remains there, and everybody goes by that. They, they, they're, they're happy to abide by the standards that we set. But guess who didn't? And guess who we sued? And guess who we beat? And that was Kinder Morgan. So, you know, growing up poor my whole life, in our community, being poor our whole life, we're, we're coming into money because the business, the business that we took part in, you know, at one point, the second best-selling wind time turbine company in Canada that, that we invested into. And now we're doing good, but we're not going to be what Canada is and the United States is, or 1% or 90% of the wealth, no. Just like we did within Tisleewitin Nation Law, making a 1,200-page assessment that we took to court that turned into a 470-page legal document that was sub submitted to the Federal Court of Appeal. We're doing the same thing that was based on our law. So we're doing the same thing, even with economic development. Even the money that we share, it's not going to go to one family. We're making policy around that. We have to. We have to make policy that looks and directs those things that were broken because of what the government did to First Nation people. We're going to put it towards education, culture, language, spirituality. All those things that we use to help us to grow, we need to teach our kids and apply it. Apply it to Canada. And that's just a part of it. We're going to change education of how we look at it as to slay with you, and we already are. We're implementing those. We have agreements with the school board, the parks board. We have agreements with them. We have agreements with the police all based on Tisleewitu Nation law. Now we're going to move forward and we're going to put it towards housing. Green Energy Initiative to make all the homes in Tisleewitu is the, one of the former chiefs is his dream and an idea to be a part of. That's the kind of investments that we want to make our community go into. And that's what our community wants, let alone the clam first clam harvest that we did in 35 years. We've been cleaning it with no resources. To the degree, the first time in 35 years we did a clam harvest, or the elk reintroduction that we did that brought back grizzly bears to our traditional territory, not far from you. Get on your boat and it's only, it's only 40 minutes from here. And it's bringing back wolves and grizzly bears and flowers and singing birds. The salmon count right there went down to 6,000. We brought it up to 5 million in five, in, in five years, in 10 years. Sorry, sorry, I, I jumped ahead. It, it wasn't that we're cleaning the water that brought back the wolves. It was the elk that we reintroduced into the traditional territory that brought back the wolves. So that's, that's what our community wants to spend their money on. That's what makes sense. And what drives us to that point is, is why it's a good idea to ask somebody like me to come up and, and to, give, to, to give a welcome is we have a reciprocal relationship of, of spirit to the lands that we're sitting on right now. We do. And that turns into our law. If that turns into our law, I'll do anything to protect my kids. I'll do anything to protect this land. And we have proven it. We have proven it. It would have been easy for a lot of my relations throughout Canada who statistically were, were like us, went through the same history, the same hurt, the same abuse. The same deaths. My mom's one of only elders that could talk about the devastation effects of little five-year-old children being murdered in residential school. And we come from there to where we are today. And my mom, in ceremony in general, to each and every one of you, she doesn't say, call me Amy. She says, ta'a. That means grandmother in our language. She embraces you the same way that the land embraces you when you call this the most beautiful place in the world. It's because our spirits and our ancestors are in the ground and we keep enhancing that and feeding that and being a part of that. That's our law. And that's what we want you to be a part of. And that's what we want this to be a part of. That's the right direction that we need to go as a community. You know, we don't ask for permission anymore. We don't. They're not going to tell us how to live our life and, 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 and to monitor and, and, and take care of our land. It changed. 250 legal victories by First Nations in the last three and a half years, 90% victories against resource extraction projects. That blows me away. What blows me away... <laughs> what blows me away more 
as those, those people grew up like I did, suffering a bit. And, and despite that, having the courage where they could take the money and put it through social programs, culture, language, they could do that if they negotiated. But what they're saying is, you can't put a price on the sacred. And that's the crutch that we use. That's the crutch that we use to pick ourselves up. Our, our reciprocal relationship with spirit, it is that way because we use those things to pray. We use that to pick ourselves up and to move forward. That's our law. And, and this is what we have to do. Don't ask permission to do it, to live your life the way you see fit, to protect what you love. And come and do it with each other. We have a word in our language and it's simple, it's not so much. Let's all do this together. One heart, one mind, and one prayer. Thank you very much. You're all welcome to my territory. Please continue the warm round of applause for Reuben George. Next, I believe we have a video for you, so sit tight. What if taking on climate change could create a better economy and millions of jobs? The Green New Deal is a plan to slash inequality and rebuild our communities while tackling the biggest threat of our time. In the U.S., momentum is building around a push for a zero-emission economy in just 10 years. How could it happen? By transforming everyday life in our communities, cities, and countries. Picture it. Publicly owned energy and sustainable family farms in every city. Fast and free public transit and affordable energy efficient housing for all. A Green New Deal would create enough work to offer a good job to anyone who wants one. And at the heart of this new economy, a commitment to the good life, universal health and childcare, more leisure time, and support for the arts. Yeah, it would be expensive, like a war, or a tax cut for the rich, but the bill would be a fraction of the cost of runaway climate change, and the benefits to our society would be huge. Are you ready for a climate plan that fights injustice and inequality and makes our communities more livable and safe? Then join the push for a Green New Deal. And let's get to work. Oh, that sounds like a good deal. <laughs> Why aren't we doing it? Um, okay, how's everybody doing today? Make some noise if you're feeling good and ready. Awesome. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Anjali. I am a climate activist, a communicator, and an immigrant on these unceded lands. I will be your MC for the evening. Uh, my parents are here. Wave, say hi to them. Um, on behalf of The Leap, welcome to the Vancouver stop of the Coast to Coast Tour for a Green New Deal for All. Yeah. <laughs> the Leap is an organization that is fighting at the intersection of climate and racial justice. We feel that the stakes have never been higher and we feel a deep sense of urgency. My climate change work has taken me from the halls of the United Nations where world leaders have been debating climate change for almost 27 years with no significant action to small communities in BC where I witnessed community members passionately 
working to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable for their crimes and for their failure to pay for the cost of their actions. It seems to me that those who are on the winning end of an unequal society, including our political leaders, are living in a collective delusion. Fires, floods, and ecological collapse are on the rise, while racism and fear of the other intensify in the face of these crises. But while this is all happening, our leaders continue to invest in business as usual, as exemplified by our federal government's decision last week to um, approve a not so popular pipeline. Boo. I, like many of you, feel the collective grief of this moment also. Land defenders around the world are being assassinated and punished for their activism, including on these lands. Indigenous rights continue to be trampled by the Canadian government. Ancient ways of knowing and living on this earth are being ignored and eroded. And migration, driven by out-of-control capitalism and climate change, is met with increasing fear and hatred the world over. These concurrent crises build upon each other, fueled by a broken capitalist logic. And that is what we're here to address today. It's easy to become overwhelmed in this world of inequality and runaway climate change, but there's also hope. In this moment that we find ourselves in, this is a moment of great possibility, hope, and strength. The movement for climate justice is going strong and it's growing the world over. Indigenous leadership has seen us defeat major fossil fuel battles in Canada and around the world. And people like you are stepping up from all walks of life to do something. To me, that gives me great hope and I give you my utter and eternal admiration and respect for being in this room and for walking out of here and continuing to do this work. And now, there is a growing movement demanding a Green New Deal, a radical, but really not so radical, transformation. It is a new vision for an economy that doesn't thrive by exploiting each other and the Earth. And we're building a climate plan that fits the scale of the crisis that we now face. We're going to need everyone if we want to change everything. This month, the Pact for a Green New Deal Coalition launched over 200 town halls where communities from all across these lands have been coming together to imagine what a Green New Deal in Canada would look like. This is amazing. This is huge. 200 gatherings like this across the country. Communities are tired of an economic system that privileges the wealthy at the expense of us all, feeding climate denial and making innocent people pay for the delusion of a few. And so, we are all gathered here today to tip the scales towards a Green New Deal. And, <laughs> yes. So, today you're in for an amazing evening. You're going to hear from David Suzuki, Kanahus Manuel, Harsha Walia, and Avi Lewis. Um, these four speakers are going to take you on a journey of ideas and spell out their vision for what the Green New Deal could look like and what their work has been um, uh, on these lands to fight climate injustice. And then an incredible artist, Kim Mortal, is going to inspire and ignite you with her words and melodies and um, they are going to blow you away. Our partner organizations who are outside and all around are going to give you many pathways forward to continue this work as well. But before we go to that, the first ones up tonight are actually each one of you. We're gonna start the night with a barnstorm led by our uh, organizing partner, 350, and our time. And this barnstorm is gonna be about what the Green New Deal looks like in our community. Uh, so 350 Canada has been leading a mass mobilization for the largest voting bloc of our time, calling for a Green New Deal building towards the federal election. So what is a barnstorm? I am going to pass it over to our friends at 350 to explain and to get it started. So please give a warm welcome to Kate, Avery, and Nayeli. Hello. Hi, everyone. All right. Who is ready for a Green New Deal for Canada? Woo! Yeah. Awesome. So my name is Avery. My pronouns are they and them. And I'm from the unceded lands of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam people. 
My name is Kate, I use she, her, and I come from unceded Musqueam territories. I'm Nayeli, she, her, I'm a Mexican immigrant who also lives in these unceded lands. And we're organizers with the Our Time movement, pushing for a Green New Deal for Canada. Our generation grew up watching the Harper government unravel the most basic of environmental protections. Over the last four years, we have witnessed the Trudeau government break promise after promise while we watch his government throw billions of dollars at a pipeline on unsurrendered indigenous lands. Who's angry at the government for a day after declaring a climate emergency, purchasing and going ahead with the Trans Mountain Pipeline? Shame. Our political leaders tell us that we are asking for too much when we demand a Green New Deal. Do we agree with that? What they don't tell us is that two CEOs in Canada earn the same income as 11 million workers within two hours of starting the financial year. Shame. What they don't tell us is that $29 billion is funneled by Canada into corporate welfare every year with no return. So when we are asked, how are we going to pay for a Green New Deal? We have to have the courage to push back against this narrative of scarcity. We have enough for a transition to a 100% renewable economy. We have enough for free public transit and housing as a human right for all. Yeah. Yeah. We have enough for good jobs for everyone so that no worker is left behind. We have enough so that racialized people, migrants, the poor, and the disabled can thrive. We have enough for universal health care, for child care, for all. And we have enough for indigenous peoples to be able to determine how they govern their own lands on their own terms. Yeah. We are done with the lies, and we're especially done with the scapegoating of marginalized communities who are on the front lines right now, being, bearing the brunt of fossil fuel extraction and climate impacts, because those most vulnerable communities are the ones being affected the most, and the decisions we make here affect them, so we need to keep reminding ourselves that. <laughs> it is also by no accident that the very forces that pit us against each other, that cheer on violence against Muslims, indigenous women, and black communities are the very same forces who deny climate change and bow down to the fossil fuel industry. Well. Our Green New Deal will not bow down to hate, to white supremacy and austerity. Instead, we will build power in our communities because that's where it truly resides. On every street corner, in every workplace, in every community hub. We will organize and we will win a Green New Deal for Canada. <laughs> so, how are we going to do that, Kate? Well, let me tell you. So first, we are going to push for a federal leaders debate on the climate emergency and the Green New Deal so that every single family tuning in will hear all about it. What isn't, what isn't debated doesn't get done. Then we're going to mobilize the largest ever voting alliance of youth and millennials who are the largest voting bloc in this election. And it will be the biggest the country, this country has ever seen to put a Green New Deal on the desk of every single political candidate running in this election. We're going to turn... <laughs> We're going to turn out in record numbers to vote this election with the kind of power no political power party can ignore. We are building an unstoppable movement, and we cannot do it without all of you. To change everything, we need everyone. Every single phone call you make, every single solidarity rally you show up to, every single conversation you have matters. So who's ready? If you are under the age of 35 and ready to mobilize young people in Vancouver for a Green New Deal, can we get you to stand up or raise your hand. 
If you are over the age of 35 or young at heart, stay standing, stay standing. And you are ready to make sure the leaders of every major political party debate a Green New Deal for Canada. We're going to get you to stand up or raise your hand if you are able. Stand up, stand up. Let's get a round of applause for these beautiful human beings. Okay, stay so standing, stay, stay standing. standing, stay standing. Okay, so if you raise your hand or if you're standing up, we've got an amazing team of young organizers wearing our time t-shirts just like these. Some of them are black, some of them are white, and they're gonna go around passing out clipboards to sign all of you up who are ready to mobilize. So please just stay standing. This will take just a couple of minutes. All right. Now, if you are looking for something to do while you are waiting to get signed up to organize for the Green New Deal, we have a simple ask for you as well. We're going to ask folks to pull your phones out right now, and we want you to take 20 seconds to sign a digital petition calling on the Federal Debate Commission to create a debate on the climate emergency and the Green New Deal. So you're going to head to this link. Uh-huh. You're going to go to this link because we're all tech savvy and we all have data. And if you can't, you're going to remember what the link is and you're going to go to it later. Say the link out loud. The link is r dash time.ca slash change dash debate. <laughs> Say it again. We're going to do it again. r dash time.ca slash change dash debate. Is everybody feeling hyped? <laughs> to the sun. 
All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Right on. Thank you all for your commitment. This right here is us taking our collective future into our own hands. Our team will follow up with you within the next 72 hours um, with next steps. In the meantime, follow Our Time Vancouver on social media. And for folks under 35, we're having an Our Time 101 meeting on Monday. So look for the details in our email and on our social media for that. And give yourselves another round of applause. Yeah. Yeah, let's hear it for everyone in the room who just signed up. Yeah. Jenny. All right. And I'm going to invite the rest of the Our Time crew who is here with us tonight to come up on stage with us. Because we're going to sing a little song. I go to the next slide. All right. Who's seen this song before? All right, a few people. We're going to all learn it together. So let's do call and response. I'll say a line, and then you say it back to me, and then we'll go through it a couple times all together. Ready for this? Who's yeah. going to sing with me? Awesome. All right, here we go. The people gonna rise like the water. The people gonna rise like the water. We're gonna calm this crisis down. We're gonna calm this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter. Saying climate justice now. Saying climate justice now. All together. People gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying, This is our time now. All right, for the top. People gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying, Climate justice now. The people gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying, This is our time now. Last time, one more time. All right, thank you, everyone. Y'all should learn that song, because that is a staple <laughs> of the movement. It's a beautiful song. All right, so we are going to get into our incredible speakers. Uh, first up, we have an amazing person who I'm sure most of you know. Uh, Dr. David Suzuki is a... Yep. Is a scientist, broadcaster, author, and co-founder of the David Suzuki Foundation. I'm sorry, I've got to say the whole thing. <laughs> He's familiar to everyone as the host of the CBC Science and Natural Television series, The Nature of Things. In 1990, he co-founded the David Suzuki Foundation with Dr. Tara Cullis to collaborate with Canadians from all walks of life, including government and business, to conserve our environment and find solutions that will create a sustainable Canada through science-based research, education, and policy work. We just want to acknowledge that this is David's fifth stop on the Green New Deal for All Tour. Please give him a warm welcome. He's traveled across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really thank the, the LEAP and uh, 350.org for giving me the opportunity to share a few ideas with you. But before I begin, I would like to add my acknowledgement that this is all possible 
because we're on the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam, and the Squamish. And I say that not as a simple ritual, the way you may say the Lord's Prayer or sing the national anthem, but I say it to reflect and realize that in, so in surviving colonization and genocide and its genocidal consequences, indigenous people everywhere have clung to their values and their attachment to place that we settlers desperately need to learn from them. And I thank Reuben for sharing his, uh, his ideas. And we see why indigenous people must be the leaders in this, in this battle now, because we've got to learn to see the world through their eyes. I speak to you, to you this evening as a, an elder, as a scientist, and as a grandfather. Like all elders, I think this is the most important part of my life because I'm no longer constrained. I don't have to kiss anybody's behind in order to get a job or a raise or a, or a promotion. And I, uh, I no longer are, am driven by money or power or, or, or fame. These are all parts of the past. And so I can speak the truth from my heart. And if that offends people, that's their problem, not mine. Like, as a scientist, I take what my fellow scientists in the community uh, tell us. I take it very seriously and base my own personal analyses and judgments on the best scientific information available. And as a grandfather, I know that the science shows that the future for my grandchildren is very uncertain indeed. You see, we are at an absolutely unprecedented moment in all of human existence. What is or is not done in the next few years will determine whether we even survive as a species. Now that's a pretty melodramatic statement and I know some of you may think, oh God, Suzuki, stop exaggerating or making these. I am only repeating what the leading scientists of the world are now telling us. Human beings have become so numerous that we have a very heavy ecological footprint. It takes a lot of air, water, and land just to keep us alive. But we're, we've massively amplified that blueprint or that footprint with technology and a global economy that is driven by the never-ending demand for more stuff. And that's why scientists now call this the Anthropocene Epoch, the age of humans when we have become the major factor altering the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the planet on a geological scale. There's never been a species able to do that. Yet despite our enormous success as a species, the fact is we remain too ignorant to be able to apply the power we've acquired in a sustainable way. And so we are undermining the life support systems of the planet, the air, the water, the soil, and the species diversity. The result is that we face a very uncertain and uncharted future. So in this time, what or who do we use as our authority to guide us into these uncertain waters? Do we look to the Bible? There are a lot of people that do. Do we look to the Quran? Do we look to the Wall Street Journal? Or the Fraser Institute? Or Donnie Trump? Science is not all-knowing, but is the best we have, even with its limitations, for describing the state of the world and our impact on it. What is needed are the values and perspectives of indigenous cultures to guide that science with qualities of respect, gratitude, humility, and responsibility to nature. How did we arrive at this moment? To answer that, I believe we must think of ourselves in evolutionary terms. When we appeared as a species in Africa 150 to 200,000 years ago, we weren't very impressive to the other animals that occupied the, the savannas of Africa. I am sure no other species, when we walked by, went to their children, shh, don't piss him off, 
They're going to take over the planet. I mean, there weren't many of us. We weren't big. We weren't fast. We weren't strong. We, look how many of us are wearing glasses. Uh, we weren't very gifted with sensory ability. We were just another two-legged, furless ape. But we had a huge advantage. It was a one and a half kilogram organ buried deep in our skulls. The human brain conferred a massive memory. No other mammal has the memory capacity of a human brain. We were curious. We had great observational abilities and we were creative. We were an inventive animal. And those qualities more than compensated for our lack of physical or sensory shortcomings. That brain did something very special. It invented an idea called the future. Future doesn't exist. The only thing that is real is now and our memory of what was in the past. But because we invented the concept of a future, <coughs> we're the only animal that realized we can affect the future by what we do now. By our experiences, by the accumulated knowledge, we can now look ahead and we can see where there are dangers. We can see where there are opportunities and we can deliberately choose today to avoid the dangers and exploit the opportunities. I believe foresight was the great quality that gave us a huge advantage over the rest of nature. And it was, you know, in the beginning it's very simple. You're walking down a path, it branches in two and you go, oh yeah, I went down that way a few months ago and I ran into a saber-toothed tiger. But when I went that way, I found something good to smoke. I mean, eat. And so I'm going, I'm going that way. That's what we did. And foresight was the key to our, our great success. And over tens of thousands of years, we moved. We moved over continents, over entire oceans. We don't know why there was this constant moving. No doubt, the, as we grew in numbers, you know, the, we overran resources. There were probably rivalries and com competition. I like to think of teenage kids looking for action on the other side of a mountain. Uh, you know, we bred with Neanderthals and probably someone said, they're good looking Neanderthals over there. And anyway, whatever the reason, we moved. And when we came to new areas, we were an invasive species. We didn't know how it all worked. Even with stone axes and spears, we were a deadly predator. You can follow as we moved across the earth. You can follow a wave of extinction of the slow moving, the big animals like giant sloths or even mammoths that we extinguished with our simple tools. And we had to learn, if we're gonna stay in our new places, we had to learn how to do it in a way that was genuinely sustainable. And so while people were moving constantly looking for new resources, the people that stayed said, remember what our ancestors did. They made mistakes, they had failures, they succeeded. That is the body of life experience that is embedded in indigenous, indigenous cultures around the world. And that knowledge has been tested by time and the survival of the people that had that knowledge. And that is something that is priceless that will never be duplicated by science. And that is the reason why the rise of indigenous people against their, uh, their history is so important to all of us. They've got something we desperately need and I'm always amazed that they're willing to share it with us. For 99% of human existence, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers and then 10,000 years ago, we became farmers. We always knew for all that time as nomads or as farmers, that weather, climate, the seasons, snow in the winter, related to moisture in the soil in the summer, pollination by insects, uh, nitrogen fixation by certain plants. We understood that those were critical for our survival. We understood that we were deeply embedded in nature and utterly dependent on nature for our well-being. That is what's called an ecocentric way of seeing the world. We are embedded in a mesh, a, a web of interconnections between other species as well as the, the soil, the rocks, the water, the air. Today, like our distant ancestors, scientists armed with supercomputers are looking ahead to see where the opportunities 
and the hazards lie. And for over 50 years, the leading scientists of the world have been telling us we are moving along a very dangerous path, that the opportunities lie in changing direction and moving towards the protection of nature and sustainability. Those must be the driving principles of the way that we live. But ever since the Industrial Revolution, two, three hundred years ago, we began to think, oh, wow, we're, we're smart. We can invent machinery and things to do things that you, we couldn't do as, as a biological creature. We don't have to live within the rules of nature. We're above it. And so began a fundamental shift that said, we're at the center of the action. Everything out there is for us. We can decide what we want to use. And that is what we call an anthropocentric worldview. It's what we think that we're everything and everything around is for us. Thus, the legal system defines property and human rights. But where is the right of a river to flow as it must? Or a walrus or a songbird to live out its full life as it evolved to do? Or a forest to flourish as a community of plants and animals? Through anthropocentrism, we have built an economic system based on human creativity and productivity. But nature's services, the uh, creation of oxygen through photosynthesis, the absorption of carbon, the uh, filtration of water percolating through the earth, the creation of soil. Do you know that every bit of our nutrition was once alive? That is all a, a result of what nature does for us. Economists regard their loss as an externality. It's irrelevant to the economic system we have. Have you ever heard of anything more insane than that? As animals, we are utterly dependent on nature for our well-being and survival, and economists think we're so great that we don't have to have nature. It's irrelevant. It's human productivity and creativity. Instead, what economists did is to build a system on a suicidal model of cancer cells. Endless growth, which is impossible in a finite world. But in using growth as a measure of success, and talk to any politician, talk to any business person, how well did you do last year? And within a picosecond, they'll be talking about growth. And the, uh, that's the very definition of progress. But in putting growth as the top of our, our agenda, we don't ask the important questions. What's an economy for? Are there no limits? Are we happier with all this stuff? How much is enough? And when we are anthropocentric political system only looks from one election to the next. So since plants and animals, children and future generations don't vote, they are not on the political agenda. And when we appoint ministers of forests, fisheries and oceans, the environment, their job is not to protect forests, fish, oceans, or the environment. Their job is to protect humans who will interact with and use those parts of nature. So whether it's the legal, the economic, or the political systems, they're fixed. These are human-centered constructs that ensure nature loses every time because our demands come first. You saw it in spades when Mr. Trudeau announced the, uh, the approval of the pipeline. He said, we have to balance the environment with the economy. What the hell is he talking about? Without the environment, you have no economy. But that's the anthropocentric worldview. But at a, at a time when we've elevated our creations above the rest of nature, we've turned our backs on the survival strategy that got us here. Look ahead, see where the dangers and opportunities lie, and then act accordingly. That's why in 1992, a remarkable document was released. It was called World Scientist Warning to Humanity. It was signed by 70, uh, 1,700 senior scientists from 71 countries in the world, including more than half of all Nobel Prize winners alive at that time. 
So that's an impressive uh, group of signatories. And what did it say? Here's how it started. Human beings in the natural world are on a collision course. Human activities inflict harsh and often irreversible damage on the environment and on critical resources. If not checked, many of our current practices put at serious risk the future we wish for human society and may so alter, uh, sorry, we wish for human society in the plant and animal kingdoms and may so alter the living world that it will be unable to sustain life in the manner that we know. Fundamental changes are urgent if we are to avoid the, the, the uh, collision our present course will bring about. This is in 1992. The document then went on to list the areas of collision, the atmosphere, water resources, oceans, soils, forests, species extinction, and overpopulation. And then the words grow even more alarming. 1992. No more than one or a few decades remain before the chance to avert the threats we now confront will be lost and the prospects for humanity immeasurably diminished. A great change in our stewardship of the earth and life on it is required if vast human misery is to be avoided and our global home on this planet is not to be irretrievably mutilated. It then listed at the end of the document the five things that had to be started immediately. One, bring environmentally destructive activities under control and protect the integrity of Earth's systems that keep us alive and healthy. Two, manage crucial resources on which we depend more effectively. Three, stabilize population. Four, uh, reduce and eventually eliminate poverty. Ensure, and five, ensure sexual equality and guarantee women control over their own reproductive decisions. This is... This is a shocking, this is a shocking document because scientists as a rule don't like to sign such strongly worded uh, documents. Yet it was virtually ignored around the world. And that's why 25 years later in 2017, more than 17,000 scientists signed a second warning to humanity that indicated all but one of the problems cited in the first warning had grown worse. And there were new problems that weren't even recognized back in 1992. There was barely a ripple in the media. So in October of last year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued an urgent warning that if we do not restrict temperature from rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times by 2100, climate chaos will ensue and, <coughs> and the foundations of civilization, our food system and the economy especially, will be catastrophically disrupted. To avoid that, the IPCC continues, we must reduce fossil fuel use by 45% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Targets that according to Bill Reese, who developed the ecological footprint as a measure of our impact, demand reduction of a 6% of fossil fuel use per year starting yesterday. One day after the IPCC report was released in October, marijuana became legal in Canada and pushed all other story, stories out of the way. In May of this year, the United Nations released a huge scientific study that indicates humans are causing a catastrophic rate of extinction that threatens a million species of plants right now. But without our relatives, all the other organisms that create our healthy environment, it is a delusion to think we can survive such an extinction crisis. In any extinction episode, apex predators, and we are the top predator on the planet, are most vulnerable. The day after the UN report was released, Megan and Harry had a baby and everything disappeared 
from the media. WTF! It's not the media are spreading fake news. They're spreading trivial news driven by obsessive focus on celebrity, sports, wealth, and power. Well, one person who takes science and scientists seriously is Greta Thunberg. And on behalf... And on behalf of her generation, she has called out politicians who claim they are taking action, yet all the while emissions have continued to rise. And so she has galvanized young people whose very futures are now at stake and calls on parents and teachers and grandparents and everyone who loves children to make their future the highest priority. It has to be done. And this evening's program offers a way to meet the IPCC targets while ensuring the weakest, the poorest, the most vulnerable among us are cared for and where jobs will be created in an ecocentric world. So let's start it now. Keep it going for David Suzuki. We're so lucky to have David. Uh, this is his final stop on the tour. Um, I feel so blessed to have heard so much wisdom and uh, to be able to hear him speak. Um, so, wow, that really got things started on a great foot. Uh, we're gonna move straight into our next speaker. And um, the next speaker is Kanahus Manuel. Um, and Kanahus Manuel is Sequepmec and Tunatsa. She's a member of the Sequipment Women Warriors and Tiny House Warriors, um, a mother of four and a twin. Kanahus is a traditional birth keeper, traditional tattoo artist, you can see all her dope tattoos, and a warrior. Uh, Kanahus is well known for her activism and direct actions against Sun Peak Ski Resort, Imperial Metals, the Mount Pauly Mine Disaster, and she was arrested with the water protectors at Standing Rock. She is currently playing a leadership role in fighting the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion through more than 500 kilometers of Sequatmic territory. Please give a warm, warm welcome to Kanahus Manuel. Could everybody hear? Okay. Hello everybody, my name is Kanahus Pesli. It means red woman, and I'm from the Sequatmoke and the Tanaka nations in the so-called interior of BC. We come from the mountains of the spilling waters. I'd like to also give my land acknowledgement to the ancestors of this territory the reason why, as Indigenous peoples, we are still here, the fighters, the ones that survived this genocide, as I stand here today on Indigenous Peoples Day, and it's also the summer solstice, and it's the longest daylight hours of the year. I stand here on this day to give thanks to everything of all of creation the whole energy of the universe, I give thanks to our four chiefs, which is our roots, our Spitlam, our Spakpak Ui, our Saskatoon Berry, to our Sklaltan Ui, our Swawl, our Salmon, and to our Tsi, our Deer, our four chiefs that teach us everything. When we dig our roots, the roots look like little people, our Spitlam, and inside it has a little red heart. We don't take everything. We take that heart from that speedlum. When we dig that root, we put that heart back into the earth to give back, to keep that reciprocal relationship going that we have with all of life. 
And it's the reciprocal relationship that's our economy. It's the relationship and it's the bond with these all of life that's our indigenous economy. You can't put a price on the sacred, like my brother Ruben George said. You can't put a price on that sacred. I inherited this land as indigenous people. We hold our title to our territory across this whole Turtle Island, collectively as the red people of this land. The time is now for us as indigenous people that we don't see borders. We've never seen those colonial Canadian and US borders, but also as indigenous nations for us not to see these indigenous nation borders because as red people, we have to unite together through the whole continent. This inheritance is from our grandmothers and our vision is also from our grandmothers. It's not my vision. This vision has been since the beginning of time. For tens of thousands of years, since time immemorial, maybe even a hundred thousand years, like my family is dreaming in their dreams that we've been here even longer than they say. Because we have our creation stories that come from this land. These visions, we still have these same visions today and we plant these seeds in our children. This vision of a green planet, this vision that everyone's human rights are protected, this vision, the same vision of free housing because we always had free housing for our people, free health care because we've always been able to heal ourselves, our medicine women and our medicine people and all that traditional knowledge of healing and birthing our babies. This vision has always been there. Our native people are organizing, and I hear it, the Red Deal. They say it's not new because it's ancient, like the blood of our people, the DNA of our people. Our indigenous economy, all of everything that we depend on the land and the water and the air, all of that, like Dr. David Suzuki. We all grew up. I grew up. We only had two channels, but nature of things was on one of them. <laughs> on the reserves, we all know David Suzuki. We had two channels, but we learned but he's saying that science is indigenous knowledge as well. <laughs> we are, as the indigenous people, we are the ecological biodiversity of this planet. We are the first impacted because, like I said, we're so connected to those four chiefs, to our life. We're so connected, our food, even if our food gets poisoned by mercury, like in grassy narrows, our relatives are still eating that fish. Our relatives up north, around the Alberta tar sands, Fort McMurray, our relatives, they're still eating the deer. They're still collecting those medicines and they're being impacted by that. It's affecting them. We're mutating <laughs> with these changes because we have cancers, we have things that we've never had before that we have. When Reuben George was up here, I was thinking about Chief Dan George and the movie he was in. And he laid down and he said, it's a good day to die. And he laid there, but it wasn't his time to go. He had to get up and live another day. And that's what all of us, it's not time for this planet to die. We gotta get up, we gotta live, we gotta make every single second, every single breath count. So I have a, a twin sister, Mayuk 
Pesky, the, the white weasel, the winter weasel woman. That's our warrior, our warrior medicine. But she sent me one thing that I had to say. And she said that the Green, Green New Deal has read too. As an artist, she says this. The Green New Deal, the true Green, Green New Deal would release all of stolen indigenous lands to the rightful title holders, the indigenous peoples collectively. And that the true Green Deal means land back for indigenous people. <clears throat> I see this as I come and I traveled all the way down from Blue River. We come from a massive territory, the biggest here in so-called BC, unceded, unsurrendered, 180,000 square kilometers of unceded, unsurrendered territory. Um, I traveled down here with my family and my children, my nieces and my nephews because we are fighting this pipeline and we're building tiny houses and we have the sixth tiny house on wheels that's completed by the volunteer builders in Victoria and we're on our way to pick that up. <clears throat> We're going to be bringing, we're going to be marching with it in, in Victoria, a 22K march. We're going to be bringing it here to Vancouver. And we want support. We need our allies to come out on Sunday. And we're meeting at 520 Alexander Street. And you could probably hashtag Tiny House Warriors. I'm not sure what the event page is under, I forget. But Tiny House Warriors, you're going to be able to find the information. Right now, it's very serious what is happening on the front lines. We have police, constant police surveillance, and it, they've up, upped their police surveillance a month ago when the Thompson-Nicola Regional District had a meeting in Kamloops, and they talked about tiny house warriors there without us being present. And they had people complaining about us being on our own land. And they said, we need to do something about these tiny house warriors. We need to get them off the land. But it's our land. And my father let everybody know what the 0 0.2, about the 0.2%. That's if you add up all the Indian reserves in all of Canada, it's going to equal 0.2%. Canada and the Crown, they hold that other 99.8%. He would say, you don't have to be a PhD economist to know who is going to be rich and who is going to be poor. It's easier to fight the poor, and that's where they've kept us, and that's what colonization is, displacing us from our territory and making us dependent on them because they hold the wealth. They're holding the wealth of our lands, and that's why we say the Red Deal this Green New Deal needs to include this Red Deal, where Indigenous people have full ownership, control, and jurisdiction over their traditional territories, because that's... <laughs> that's when we're going to see this Green New Deal be successful. Because you need us, and we need you. We need each other. We need each other. Like they said, it's going to take all of us, everyone, all of us, every single one of those pusmas, all those hearts inside all of us, and what we love. We love our children, our grandchildren. We love clean water. We love to breathe this air, this quality of air that not everyone around the world gets to breathe, but we do here. We get this quality of air. But the forest fires, no. They don't leave us with this type of quality of air. And these are the impacts of climate change. Courage. We're all going to have to take that courage because it's scary to face up and face off against the beast. It's scary to face off against the monster coming to ravage us. But we have to take that courage. And it's the warriors, it's those young ones that were up here, the ones with the energy and the power and the voice and the energy. The warriors, 
all across. We need to support them. 110%, we need to support them. We need to give them money. We need to give them volunteer hours. Because that's where we're going to see the change, because they're the ones with the energy. And collectively, with this intelligence, because they grew up listening to nature of things, they have that collective intelligence. We all do. We have such a mass amount of collective intelligence in here. It proves it by you being here today. And I thank you for coming together today on this very powerful, powerful day. My father, he would say to his daughters and his sons, fighting for the land is going to leave you face down with the cuffs on. Face down with the cuffs. That's where it's gonna lead you. And you have to take that courage. And me and my sisters, we have faced that, face down with cuffs on, standing up for our land. When we fight for our land, that's where it leads us. With the facing off with the police, which is Canada's front line, and forcing us into the courts. And my twin sister and my younger sister, Mayuk Manuel, Nudetgua Manuel, and my brother-in-law, Aisha Jules, have some criminal charges and they're trying to charge them. They're forcing them to go to trial on January 20th, 2020. We're going to the first round table indigenous consultation that Frank Yakubuchi called for the Trans Mountain Phase 3 indigenous consultation in Kamloops, December 10th. This past December 10th. International Human Rights Day, they decided to have their first Indigenous Roundtable after the Federal Court of Appeal had halted it. My sisters and my brother were face down with cuffs on that day. Frank Yakabuchi, right there, my sisters. While I was on the front line up there in Blue River, I had to witness that. How could that be a retired su Supreme Court justice for Canada violating Indigenous rights, violating Indigenous women? We see that all too often, and we need people to stand up. We need people to come to their trial. We need people to know that we aren't criminals. We're fighting for our rights. We're fighting for our land. We're fighting for everybody because we all drink that same water. The Fraser River starts way up past Blue River. The Fraser River that is the watershed for two-thirds of this province. Right now has a discharge permit by the province of BC discharging M Mount Polly mine waste right into Quinell Lake that flows right into the Fraser River. Those same permits are being approved right now for these man camps at Blue River, Belmont, Clearwater, all the way down the line, there's man camps. These man camps are linked to the violence against Indigenous women, including sexual attacks, rapes, the violence, the drugs, the alcohol, the meth, the fentanyl, everything that gets flooded into these areas when you bring in a thousand men. And it's scary because we're already facing off with them on the front lines. And they're coming and threatening our lives. They're saying that they're going to kill us. They're going to come back and kill us and I can't sleep. I sleep with one eye open. I sleep with my combat boots on. So coming down off the front line and coming here and speaking to you is like what Ruben said. I feel real awkward up here. Because <laughs> usually I'm yelling at people up there. <laughs> but I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for, for opening up the space and we're going to be heading over to Victoria, and we're shutting this down. If you're going to come, come over. We're going to be marching all day, and we're going to be ending at 5 o'clock at a beach with a barbecue. So it's going to be a really family-friendly, child-friendly event, and we encourage people, if they want to come for the day, come over to Victoria, and you could help come and find us. We want to make allies, and we want to build this collective intelligence, you know, protect our planet.
Sheesh. Wow, Kenneth's dropping so many truth bombs. I don't even know which one to, to quote. Wow. Especially what she said about it's easy to fight the poor. And that is what we're fighting with the Green New Deal. It's that deep inequality that underpins the system. So we're halfway through our program for tonight. And um, I think it's just really important to point out what important piece each speaker is bringing. Each speaker is bringing such a different and important perspective um, that's all adding up to the pieces of this Green New Deal. Um, and I just want to acknowledge also, we're all in this together. Like this night is a conversation. It's not just the speakers talking at you. Uh, it's all of us breaking new ground. Like this is a very new thing. The Green New Deal means we have to fight climate change by dismantling our entire current crappy systems, all of them. Patriarchy and its toxic relations. White supremacy and its racism and fear of the other. Inequality, the anthropocentric worldview that David talked about, the exploitation that underpins this entire economy. We have the chance to change that all together. So our next speaker, she's gonna fire you up and I'm glad to call uh, Harsha my friend. Um, Harsha Walia is a co-founder of the migrant justice group No One Is Illegal. She's also the award-winning author of Undoing Border Imperialism and project coordinator at the Downtown Eastside Women's Center. For the past two decades, she's been involved in anti-racist, anti-imperialist, feminist, and low-income grassroots community organizing, including through anti-capitalist convergence, Olympics resistance network, boycott, divest sanctions campaigns. These are all things you should Google later. Defenders of the Land Network and the February 14th Women's Memorial March Committee. Hasha is a recipient of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives Power of Youth Award and the West Enders Best of the City and Activism Award. Please give her all your energy as she comes up and shares her truth. How's everyone doing? Yeah, it's a beautiful crowd. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to the previous speakers, to Brother Ruben George, Sister Kanahus Manuel, Dr. David Suzuki, and to the organizers for putting this together. I wanna start by acknowledging, of course, that we're here on unceded lands, the lands of the Musqueam, the Squahopmish, and the Tsleil-Waututh people. And today on National Indigenous Peoples Day, it's important that we not just acknowledge land, but acknowledge that what is happening on these lands is genocide. We have to be unequivocal about it because there seems to be a debate about whether this is true or not. So let's be unequivocal that what is happening here on these lands is in fact genocide. The ongoing occupation of these lands the denial of indigenous jurisdiction, and the approval of Trans Mountain expansion, which will also come with man camps on Chiquatmuk territory, are all acts of ongoing genocide. That the doctrine of discovery that founded Canada decreed that any land that was not inhabited by Christians was open for European settlement is genocide. Despite apologies for residential schools, that there are three times more children who were apprehended today than ever were in residential schools is genocide. That our politicians can figure out how to drill and frack and mine in northern communities, in rural communities, in every single indigenous community, they've figured out how to extract resources, but cannot somehow figure out how to build schools how to get clean water, how to ensure food security is a deliberate act of genocide. Canada is genocide. And we are all here because we feel the urgency of addressing the climate crisis. We know that parts of the world are drowning, other parts of the world are on fire. And I wanna invite us to think today about addressing the climate crisis at its roots. The roots of the climate crisis is not a result of humans not recycling enough, 
or using too many plastic straws, though of course it is also that, but that's not the root. It is the violent foundations of our social, economic, and political systems that are creating climate injustice. The climate crisis that is upon us is a symptom. It's a symptom, a devastating symptom of our colonial, capitalist, and oppressive system. And a Green New Deal, as Sister Kanahus mentioned, must be in its essence a Red New Deal, which as the comrades down south of the Red Nation call it, it must be read both in its orientation towards indigenous liberation and it must be read in terms of being radically left. A Green New Deal cannot, it simply cannot be based on market-led solutions. It must be anti-capitalist because it is capitalism and its incessant drive for profits that turns everything that is sacred, like land and water, into a commodity with a price tag. This is the same trickle-up system, not trickle-down system as we're told, but a trickle-up system that exploits labor where in Canada, the richest CEOs make more in two days than an average worker makes in Canada the entire year. We know that just 100 corporations across this world are responsible for almost 80% of global emissions. We will be completely ineffective at tackling climate change unless we shut down these 100 corporations. That means we cannot plead with them to be more green. We cannot plead with them to please be more ethical or more sustainable. They have to be fucking shut down. <laughs> Climate change is also, being, is also being exacerbated by neoliberal austerity. And what that is, is basically centrist governments saying we have to tighten our belts because there are no public resources. But imagine, let's imagine that instead of Justin Trudeau giving $4 billion in subsidies to fossil fuel giants and buying a $4.5 billion pipeline that will actually never get built on these lands. Imagine that instead our governments upheld the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. That our governments that our governments respected the principle of free, prior, and informed consent. <laughs> that these settler governments returned land and jurisdiction to indigenous nations. <laughs> that we guaranteed a living wage for all Canadians as the National Inquiry actually calls for. When it comes to the tar sands, the Polaris Institute has detailed that over half of Alberta's tar sands actually goes to the United States. And as we know, the US Department of Defense is the world's leading single buyer and consumer of oil. There is a clear connection between the tar sands in this country and those who are impacted by military crusading all around the world. We cannot simply oppose individual pipeline projects because they happen in our backyard. We need to demand an end to the entire military industrial complex that is fueling tar sands production. And the global military industrial complex that is occupying and killing black and brown people across the world. And so imagine, let's imagine that instead of Trudeau announcing that he would boost Canada's military defense budget by 73% to wage illegal wars around the world, we had free health care, that we had extended pharmacare, and that we had decriminalization and a safe supply to reverse the devastating death toll of the opioid crisis. Imagine that instead of every major Canadian city spending more than a quarter of their entire operating budget on police, 
to profile, harass, and arrest black, indigenous, racialized, trans, and poor communities every day, or instead of spending money on the RCMP to violently criminalize land defenders like what happened earlier this year in Wet'suwet'en territories under this provincial government, that instead we had free education for all. <laughs> that we had free public transit so that there are no more Highway of Tears and no more Lucia Vega Jimenez's who died in border custody after non-payment of transit fare. And imagine that we had universal childcare so that not one more child is kidnapped from a low-income indigenous single mother. <laughs> imagine that here in Vancouver, if we really lived up to our label of a green city, imagine if the city of Vancouver stopped having some of the world's lowest corporate tax rates which makes us a mining headquarter across the globe. And if, imagine if we actually lived in a, in a green city, if our municipal government would make sure that these notorious mining giants don't get tax incentives and that we fucking kicked out corporations like Gold Corp from our city. Imagine that instead of our green city putting urban gardens on top of gentrifying condos to claim environmental victories, that instead we had homes for all. Especially for every indigenous woman in the downtown east side fleeing violence or facing the threat of child apprehension and that these homes were based on need and not the speculation of this ridiculous market. Imagine that instead of the Canadian government spending almost one million dollars to fight Cindy Blackstock and First Nations children in court, the government instead went after Canadian corporate giants that have, tra giants that have transferred more than 1.6 trillion dollars into offshore tax havens and have avoided at least 12 billion dollars in taxes. So we know we know that there is no scarcity of resources. It's about political will and political power. It's about the government determining its priorities based on strategies of inequality and critically, racism. If we want to address climate change, we must also address the racism that underpins all aspects of government policy, every single industry operation, and all of our social relations. This past month, we have witnessed mainstream media commentators have their knickers in a total knot debating whether genocide against indigenous nations is real, or more recently, whether the mass imprisonment of migrant families without trial actually constitutes concentration camps. But they have no problem blasting the headline terrorism when it comes to Muslim communities or Palestinian resistance movements like BDS. But we wouldn't know this. We wouldn't know this from media headlines that use terms like controversial to describe racism. Like in our city recently, in describing anti-black apartheid architect Cecil Rhodes, whose plaque shamefully hangs on a local Vancouver school. But Canada's own spy agency, CSIS, who is no actual friend of ours. But CSIS actually lists white supremacists as Canada's number one domestic threat. There are at least 200 white supremacist groups operating in Canada right now that are overground, a number that has doubled, doubled in just one year. There are at least 50 identified members of white supremacist groups in the Canadian military, and Quebec has just shamefully passed a racist law barring public school teachers, government lawyers, and others from wearing religious symbols while at work, fueling racism and Islamophobia. Muslims in Canada have reported an increase of 253% of hate crimes in the past four years. It's important to remember, though, that in this era of Ford and Sheer and escalating white supremacy, that white supremacy is not being imported to Canada by Donald Trump, but that the first white supremacists on this land were the colonizers who massacred indigenous peoples and enslaved black and indigenous people.
So again, there is no climate justice without racial justice. And the only thing that pro-pipeliners like the Yellow Vest hate more than environmental legislation is pro-immigration legislation, both of which they link to loss of jobs. Even though we know that a Green New Deal would bolster well-paying, safe, unionized jobs in the public sector in a just transition. And we know, we know that these racists don't actually care about workers, especially the hundreds of migrant workers actually toiling in the tar sands as indentured laborers. In one year alone, there were over 800 complaints from migrant workers working in the Alberta tar sands. In the most high profile incident, four migrant workers were critically injured and two migrant workers died at a processing facility. Migrant workers are some of the most vulnerable workers in our communities. They are essentially temporarily allowed in the country to work and when they are no longer needed, they are deported. It is not a coincidence that Canada today accepts more people as migrant workers, as temporary migrant workers than permanent residents. This is a consequence of a structurally violent immigration system intended to exploit people. Around the world, an average of 26.4 million people per year are being displaced from their homes brought on by environmental disasters. This is the equivalent of one person being displaced every single second. By the year 2020, there will be 50 million climate refugees. Canadian companies operate sweatshops in Bangladesh's special economic zones. Canada is home to 70% of global mining. And Canadian manufactured weapons are being sold to Saudi Arabia and being used in the, in the devastating war in Yemen. But our government does not even recognize climate refugees. The few thousand refugees that we do accept out of the millions across this world are now becoming subject to the most vitriolic racist hate with daily diatribes about quote unquote illegals and queue jumpers. We have to remember the enemy arrives in a limousine, not on a boat. <laughs> Millions of migrants around the world and within our borders are being treated as expendable as the land, air, and water that elites and their corporate friends are digging up and polluting. And finally, it is not a coincidence that communities who are downstream from the tar sands are indigenous communities, like the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, Beaver Lake Cree Nation, Lubicon Cree Nation. These are communities whose lands are being destroyed, whose food systems are being annihilated, whose communities are facing alarming rates of cancer. The Beaver Lake Cree Nation is taking the government to court for no less than 17,000 treaty violations. And the hard but real truth, the hard and real truth is that if the immediately downstream communities from the tar sands were white communities, we would simply not have this degree of industrial genocide. And this industrial extraction on indigenous lands increases violence against indigenous women, girls, trans, and two-spirit peoples. In two days, the Wet'suwet'en are organizing a red dress campaign to oppose the coastal, gas fracked ga the coastal gas fracked gas pipeline and also the man camp that is being built on unceded Unistoten lands. So to conclude, Turning back climate change and ecological destruction is not some savior mission to save the land. Prisons, reservations, borders, sweatshops, pipelines, gentrification, and drone warfare are all interrelated systems of exploitation and control that we must fight together. The greatest the greatest possibility of a Green New Deal is not a new climate policy. It's that it fundamentally transforms how we live. We can stop prisons. We can end gentrification. We can end wars and militarization. We must end our economic system that places all that is sacred onto the market for profits. We must absolutely uphold the self-determination of indigenous nations. We must demand not one more detention, not one more deportation, 
and full permanent immigration status for all migrants and refugees. We must value and pay living wages for the feminist economies of the public sector, like our teachers and nurses and retail workers who do the hardest work, who do the hardest work in our communities but are paid the least. We must turn away from the cruelty, the cruelty of oppression towards care. And climate justice must more than anything be about collective liberation because the violence of this system is not an aberration. It was built this way. The late great Eduardo Galeano says, quote, indignation, indignation must always be the answer to indignity. Reality is not destiny, end quote. Reality is not destiny. We are at a tipping point, but reality is not destiny. We must orient ourselves towards freedom because our lives, our lives and the future of the planet depends on it. We are one heart and many hands in the struggle. And when we come together, we can win. Thank you. Keep it going! Sheesh. Check. Sheesh, Harsha. Gosh. Indignation must always be the response to indignity. Okay guys, so we just got really riled up by a bunch of truth bombs from Hasha Walia over here. Um, and I think we need to get ourselves moving before we move into another speaker and an incredible musical performance. So if I could get you guys to rise. And do you remember the song that we just sang about half an hour ago? Can I get some our time people up here? We're gonna sing that song again. Maybe about three times through and really feel it this time. So remember, the lyrics are people going to rise like the water. We're going to calm this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter singing climate justice now. And move your bodies a little bit. All right, ready? All right. We all know this song, so let's just do it all together. Ready? Three. Two, one, people gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying climate justice now. The people gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying this is our time now. People gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying climate justice now. Last verse! People gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying this is our time now! Woo! Give yourselves a huge hand and shake it out before you take a seat. Okay, thanks guys. Sorry I didn't give you no warning about that. <laughs> and uh, we got you to do that because uh, I'm going to talk at you solidly for the next couple minutes because Next up, we have a performance from the incredible Kimortal. But before I introduce them, we want to uh, shout out and thank our sponsors and, and our partners. So we want to thank our amazing national and local partners on the Green New Deal tour. And these are also organizations that would be good to follow up with, to stay abreast of this work. If you want to stay involved, um, by the end of the night, you're going to be equipped with so many practical and doable ways to do so. So first up, uh, the organizing partner for this event, uh, for this whole tour, is 350 Canada and Our Time. 
Uh, our time, um, the volunteers were the people who were guiding you through the incredible barnstorm and singing. Uh, so 350 is working with young people from across the country with a campaign called Our Time to mobilize the millennial voice behind a Green New Deal and to push for a federal leaders debate on the climate emergency. Next up is our media sponsor, Briar Patch Magazine. You can see their booth outside. Their new issue is focused on the idea of a just transition, how we lead a massive economic shift without leaving anyone behind. You can get a copy or you can sign up for a discounted subscription at the tables in the back. This is a great publication if you haven't read it already. Yep. Uh, our national partner is the Canadian Union of Postal Workers who have been pushing delivering community power, which is a transformative and visionary plan to transform Canada's huge network of post offices into hubs of the Green New Deal with clean energy. Yep postal banking, and community services. The LEAP actually helped to develop this plan, and uh, we love it, and uh, you should help to fight for it at deliveringcommunitypower.ca. If you have a pen, you should write that down. Deliveringcommunitypower.ca. Uh, we're going to clap for all these partners at the end because they're all incredible. Uh, another partner is Climate Strike Canada. Yeah. In 2019, hundreds of thousands of youth in over 100 cities and towns in Canada walked out of class on Fridays, have been walking out of class on Fridays, to fight for systemic change in the face of the climate crisis. Youth and adults will unite during the week of September 20th to 27th for massive worldwide strikes, and you need to be there. So mark those dates mentally, September 20th to 27th. The Council of Canadians is a social justice organization with a network of 60 chapters across the country, helping to win a Green New Deal by organizing cities and towns to become Green New Deal communities. You can get an organizing kit at canadians.org slash Green New Deal. And that should give you materials to get started on your own and with your community. Uh, courage is a member-led democratic socialist organization created to bridge the divide between movement and electoral politics. You can learn more or become a member at couragecoalition.ca. All these things to follow up on. <laughs> and uh, finally, but not least, the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change is a national alliance of migrant worker community, labor, and advocacy groups fighting for better working conditions and protections and justice for migrant workers. Uh, Harsha touched on that in uh, her talk just now. Um, they're also part of the Migrant Rights Network, a cross-Canada network of migrant organizations, labor groups, and allies that has formed to fight the, ra the rise of racism and xenophobia. Please give a very warm thank you to all of those sponsors that I just mentioned. And as I mentioned, you can find out more about them after the event. Their reps are all around. Um, and we'll be at the booths outside as well. So, moving into, I think, my favorite part of the night. Uh, we're going to have a performance for you. And this is not just any performance. Uh, Kim Mortal is an incredible artist, probably my favorite artist in the city. Uh, she is, or they are, a queer Filipinx artist of lines and rhymes born on unceded Coast Salish territory. The artist born Kim Bincy Villahante is paving a path with a penchant for well-crafted pop and big beats and bold lyricism. Featured in South by Southwest, Rufflandia, Junofest, and the Queer Women of Color Film Festival. Check out Kim Mortal's newest album, X Marks the Swirl, available on all platforms. I can attest to the incredible nature of this album. So. Before I bring Kim up here, I just want to acknowledge that the artists of our society are the truth tellers. They are the people who reach into their hearts and lay them out on the stage for you. And so I would love for you to give this artist as much as they're giving to you. Give them all your warmth, your love, your energy, your body movement. So I'd love to see some movement. I'd love to see you standing up. I'd love to see dancing. I'd love to see people coming closer. And if you know the lyrics, yell them along like I'm going to be doing. 
Uh, also, and this deserves a huge round of applause, Kim also just received the amazing honor of making the Polaris Prize long list. And if you don't know, now you know, that's a very prestigious prize. Congrats to them and their passion and dedication for their message. So let us give a big, warm, and passionate welcome to Kim Mortal. Hey, hey, everybody. How's it going? Awesome. Um, first of all, thank you, David Suzuki, Kanahus, Harsha. Thank you, Anjali. Thank you for holding this space. Thank you, Ruben. Um, thank you for um, uh, the honesty, the authenticity, and like honestly, that strong spirit that I want to always feel when I'm walking down bleach streets. Um, I found the interesting mix of colors, green and red actually make brown, which I find kind of cool. Um, so my name is Kim Mortal. Um, I was born Kimberly Bincy Villaganti. Um, I don't have a middle name, but I honor my mom through inserting her uh, maiden name in the middle there. Um, I'm a middle child of two Filipino immigrant uh, parents. And um, I'm going to open up with a poem. Um, here it goes. Woo! I rename myself Kim Mortal because I sense a thousand portals in the gaps that they called a dead end. I am paying homage to the Philippines, a home I wasn't born in, settler on a coast of the second generation. My parents came through Canadian immigration, a stem of ongoing occupation on unceded Coast Salish nations. I wear the stars on my chest every day. The people's ink on my skin, I have it engraved. As above, so below, ancestors surround me, seeking this music because I'm looking for my family. Constellations course through my veins. My sisters on the East Coast remind me to pray. And though sometimes I feel lonely, I know that this land will lead me. I wear the stars on my chest every day. When I say boom, you say bop. Boom. 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 Uh, heart in Tagalog uh, is puso. And so I'm going to just try to speak from my pozo uh, if I fart in my brain. Um, I grew up in the church, and uh, uh, a lot of my journey has been actually questioning what is my true culture as Filipino-Canadian. Um, and most of the time, I feel most at home in the hyphen of it. But I also am also acknowledging the fact that I have privilege as a Canadian citizen, as a light-skinned, brown person of color. I don't deal with the same issues that black and indigenous folks deal with. Um, I am always trying to unpack that in my music and find people um, to strengthen myself and others collectively, because that's really what it is about. Um, so I'm going to open up with a track called Longing, and it's about home. Then I'm going to be opening up with another track called Ice Palaces, which talks about uh, white supremacy. And then my third track is called Sad Femme Club, and it's a prayer to the goddess of queerness. And uh, it's kind of great that I'm, I'm uh, going to be performing these songs here. So uh, give me your energy. I wanna go home, 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 home. Take me away, I need to get away. I wanna know love, does anybody hear me? Hear me, hear me. 
to, 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 to take me away. I need to get away. I wanna go home. Does anybody feel me? Yeah. I am longing. I am longing. I am longing, longing for that love that picks me up and takes me higher. I am longing, 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 longing for that love that picks me up and grounds me deeper. As above, so below, I've been speaking so low, trailed back my memories to another home. I am paying homage to a home I've never lived in, settler on the coast of a another nation i want to feel this new generation speaking through my veins speaking their truth in authentic voices where are we now question everything even this foundation comfort kill it kill it that comfort speak from your heart i am speaking from my heart i am always seeing people on another new 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 generation new generation give it up Clap it, clap it, clap it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so this is the next new song. It's called Ice Palaces. Who has that fire inside of them? Who has that fire inside of them? Okay. Here we go. Ice palaces that they made for you, they made for you, for you, 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 you. Ice palaces that they made for you, they made for you, for you, 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 you. You're cooling now while my head is cold burning. You're smooth, son, cause you've got it all figured out, don't you? And I can't escape locked doors and glass ceilings. And they'll get away, this is nothing new to ya, nothing new to ya. This ain't about luck, ice palaces that they made for you, they made for you, for you, you, you. Ice palaces that they made for you, they made for you, for you, you, you. Whoa, 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 oh, oh, yeah. If you don't listen, you'll miss the sound. Locked doors, silver spoons and mouths. While some can't breathe, some yell loud. Freezing to death while you're cooling now. You talk slick, exhale your smoke and mirrors. Fire never made for this. They're building up like a game of Tetris. Running circles on those trying to make a buck. I can't feel the sun since they shot up these towers. So wanna grow a garden. So seeds of a love light in the dark for everyone. Not math and games that we hate to play. Getting crossed by iron snakes and ladders. What really matters? Banners read life over profit profits in the booth give a glimpse of the sun 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 ice palaces that they made for you they made for you for you 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 ice palaces that they made for you they made for you for you 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 oh 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 My fire never made for this. My fire never made for this. My fire never made for this. My fire never made. My fire, fire, fire. My fire never made for this. My fire never made for this. My fire never made for this. My fire never made. My fire, fire, fire. Our fire never made for this. Our fire never made for this. Our fire never made for this. Our fire never made. Our fire, fire, fire. Our fire never made for this. Our fire never made for this. Our fire never made for this. Our fire never made. Our fire, 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 fire. They made for you. 
they made for you for you 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 ice palaces that they made for you they made for you for you 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 oh, oh. Invited guests from an archipelago. I'm that hyphen in the middle. I'm a channel to my home. I will always break a binary. I'm in my own zone. I am whole like a puzzle. My body breaks a code. Their greed is not my culture. I love my flat nose. Not fluent in Tagalog, but there's knowledge in my bones. I'm a queer Filipinex. I'm a boy and a girl. I'm a treasure moving on a map. Reorient the pearl. I flip it with my competence. Resist being complicit. Dismantle, decolonize, disrupt the circus. My lines cut portals. Bleed another world. I rap to rap these wounds. This X marks a swirl, it's the movement. Snap, snap, it's the movement. Snap, snap. I know this is church and it's kind of awkward and there's a weird history, but um, it's all about moving, moving it out. Um, <laughs> Woohoo! I have one last track. The question was, can we come dance for the last hook? Yes, all of you can. Um, yeah, this next track is called Sad Femme Club, and I hope you guys like it. Uh, it opens up with a prayer. And uh, can I actually get this track a little turned up? OK, so. Uh, yeah, here we go again. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Dear goddess, give me patience. Tired of trying to explain. I've got zero tolerance when they fuck with my sacred space. Bar the trolls, hit the corners for escape. Build the platforms, take up space. Code the scripts to infiltrate. Cause you're never not fighting a racist system that keeps powers in place and that fails to acknowledge the root of your pain. So get too personal, over emotional. Where are you from? Are you beauty or praise? Over the top, I'm too little or too much. Damned if I do and I'm damned if I do not. Talking class race and their sex intersections, my feelings are valid. I won't dismiss them. I was taught not to trust my own mind and decisions. My body is my body. I won't give them an apology. Indoctrinated habits. Like small, nod your head. Uh-huh. I'll talk less. Close my legs. What? That's exactly what I just said. Are you serious? If I lose my shit right now, will I just be dismissed right now? If I lose my shit right now, will I just be dismissed right now? Will I just be dismissed? Welcome to the Sad Fan Club. Baby, you are enough. Hey, 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 hey. Welcome to the Sad Fan Club. Baby, you are enough. Hey, 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 hey. Toxic masculinity is killing all the poetry. Hold my brothers back from free flowing with the sea. Our tears like the holy ink to sink a patriarchy popping egos like balloons. Cause we don't exist for you. Burn your eyes with tiger bomb. Don't try to tell her to become colonial. Repercussions, any questions? CC the boss, I'm um, she's the boss. Expert of self, she prays to moon. They rap in spells, I'm attuned to what you're numb to. Check my mood ring. Did I ask you? No, I prefer my make-believe to their bullshit. I work within it, but at the end of shift, I build spectrums on the internet. I art attack, cause I'm an empath. Foundations, Filipinex, no limits on how I choose to express with my pixels and my queerness. You can't hold me back. If I lose my shit right now, will I just be dismissed right now? If I lose my shit right now, will I just be dismissed right now? Will I just be dismissed? Welcome to the South Fame Club. Baby, you are enough. Hey, 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 hey. Welcome to the Sad Fan Club. Baby, you are enough. Hey, hey. 
could come through. Wow, you guys did a great job. Thank you so much for honoring what I said about giving back to the artists. Give yourselves a hand for that. All right. Can I just have that piece of paper over there? I got a little caught up in the dancing. Do I? Do I, Avi? <laughs> All right, the next and final speaker for the night, but not the least, is another person that I'm very honored to call a friend. Avi Lewis is, he is that. But I can't end it there, Avi. Avi Lewis is a documentary filmmaker, a journalist, and a lecturer in journalism and media studies at Rutgers University. His 25-year journalism career has spanned award-winning, theatrically released documentaries, The Take and This Changes Everything, uh, with a not very well-known spouse of his. Um, to local news reporting on television networks worldwide. He was a co-author of The Leap Manifesto, and in 2017, he co-founded and is now strategic director of The Leap, which is the organization that has convened this tour, along with 350 Canada, and an organization that was launched to upend our collective response to the crises of climate, inequality, and racism. Please give a big and very warm welcome to Avi Lewis of The Leap. I can't believe you're still here. You're still here. It is the longest day of the year. Anybody tired? You guys ready to just wrap it up and go home? Um, so as if it wasn't hard enough to follow David Suzuki, or Kanahus, or Harsha, or Anjali, or oh my god, what just happened here, people? Did we have a dance party at the Green New Deal event? Um, it is, I, I, it's a little intimidating to, fall, to be up here. That's why I came to the podium where I could have my two gooseneck mics right here to keep me company. Um, so this evening has been an extraordinary one. Uh, we've been, this was gonna be the last step, uh, last stop on the tour. Uh, Winnipeg asserted its right to a Green New Deal event uh, sponsored by The Leap, so I'm going tomorrow to do a final, final gig. But I feel like something, I feel like something is happening. Um, it's been extraordinary to see in room after room the energy of this political moment. Uh, of course we have incredible speakers, of course we have remarkable artists, of, but it's th actually the moment that's pulling us together. And I feel like there's, an, there's a, something happening in this land where a whole bunch of people who haven't been doing this for a long time are starting to feel fear at the surface of their skin and also a sense of possibility that we haven't seen maybe ever uh, and it's a bloody good thing because it is very much the last moment. 
So you've heard from all of these extraordinary speakers about the epic nature of the challenges that we're talking about, about the deep need for transformation, not just in the way that we treat the natural world on which we depend, but in the way that we treat each other. And that's what's so beautiful about what's happening here tonight as we've gone on this extraordinary journey together, cycling through so many fundamental human feelings uh, that we're finding a new way to be together. Of course, and we acknowledge this every time, all of this must begin with a revolution of respect for indigenous peoples, the original caretakers of all that we love. And to echo what has come up again and again tonight, ecological unraveling of the kind that we're witnessing and of the kind that our, of our late capitalist society is hastening will lead to the extinction of countless peoples and cultures around the world. And knowingly allowing that to happen, despite the many decades of warnings, is genocide on an unimaginable scale. The mindset that makes this planetary crime possible, the one that puts profit and greed above all else, is the very same one that waged genocidal attack on indigenous people in this country in order to steal the land, the land that we must give back. The theft of that land was a crime to feed a global economic machine of infinite growth and consumption. And it began the process that we now call climate change alongside the seizure of African bodies as free labor and all the other crimes of in the industrial age. These are not separate or separable issues. They are different chapters in the same story, the one that is now threatening the viability of much of life on Earth. And if we want change, exactly as Harsha said, we're gonna need to go deep, down to the roots of the crisis. And now we know we have to do it on an emergency basis because our house is on fire. But here's one thing that we have to remember. That house was built on toxic ideas of sacrificial people, of discounted futures, of false promises of infinite expansion. That house was rigged to blow from the start. So our task is really simple. Let's put out the flames and build something different in its place. Maybe there'll be something a little bit less ornate, and church is a perfect place to talk about these things. <laughs> but it will be far more beautiful because it will have room for everyone that needs shelter and care. Let us build a Green New Deal. Let's build a Green New Deal. Let's build a a, a, a red new deal, let's make it a brown new deal. It is going to be a rainbow new deal. Let's be honest. The key is that it's for everyone this time. It can't be for some. And that's why you're here, right? Okay. So what the hell is a green new deal anyway? It is my happy job to offer, uh, offer my outline of what it is. First of all, there is no binder that contains the exact recipe or policy prescription. Harsha laid out a few radical demands, which I thoroughly enjoyed. But there isn't a policy book. It is our job to write it together. That's really important. But that doesn't mean it's vague or undefined. It is anything but. A Green New Deal, quite simply, is a proposal to address the climate catastrophe and social and economic injustice at the scale and at the speed that both science and indigenous knowledge have told us is required. In Canada, for starters, on the climate front, that means cutting our emissions at least in half in a decade. So what does that look like? Let's just imagine. Just, we're just talking about the climate front now. It looks like moving immediately to 100% renewable energy for electricity and then electrifying everything. How we get around, how we make our stuff, how we grow and distribute our food, everything. So we're talking about truly epic investments in clean energy, in housing, transit, food and agriculture, and universal public services. And remember, this is a transformation that must begin with the most excluded people and the most polluted places on the front lines of this crisis. So 
So a Green New Deal means a dramatic change in who and what is valued in our economy and society. We are talking about making a system run for the benefit of the many and not the few. So in this way, as our friends in the Sunrise Movement in the US like to say, the Green New Deal is not an environmental policy. It is an entirely new system of governance for the 21st century. So let's just get the scale of the solution right. And the level of public investment, of public ownership, of free and universal public services that the Green New Deal entails means something else. This is the greatest anti-austerity program of our time. The Green New Deal will bury the logic of endless cuts and privatization for good and bring us a giant step closer to a system that's based on an entirely different set of values. One in which caring for the earth and caring for each other are the overriding goals of our economy. <laughs> Sounds fairly big. How do we do something that big? All right, well, first of all, again, to repeat something that Harsha said, the first thing that we have to understand is that we can't leave it to the market with a mix of incremental incentives and barely there taxes, like the asphyxiatingly poor debate we've been having in this country for four years, thanks to a group of backroom technocrats who met in an Ottawa restaurant three days after Justin Trudeau was elected about pipelines versus a carbon tax. No, no more market mechanisms. No more shrunken debates that pose insufficient measures uh, with real ongoing crimes. But we got to be real about something else. Only a federal government, only a nation state, with the power to issue its own currency, will be able to marshal the vast resources necessary for a climate-saving transition at the scale and the speed that we need. But the problem is there isn't a government anywhere on earth that we would trust to do that. And some of our key leaders and allies who have been leading this fight for generations don't even recognize the legitimacy of those colonial structures. Which is why neither governments nor markets are going to be the protagonists of this story. People are. The people in movements who will fight to make a Green New Deal happen and the people who will directly and immediately benefit from winning it. The workers that will build the new infrastructure. The residents that will, build, that will breathe the clean air who will live in affordable green housing and benefit from free public transit. The communities, particularly those that have historically been most excluded, who will lead and shape this process at a local level, neighborhood by neighborhood, town by town, First Nation by First Nation. So we're talking about building a mass movement powerful enough to elect and hold accountable a government that will turn our vision into the law. And that's how we win a Green New Deal. It is a vast undertaking unlike any in our lifetime. There's a huge amount of hope right now, which is lovely to feel, but let's not diminish the scale of the task ahead of us. But let's also acknowledge that we are in this weird little frictionless political moment, and it is the perfect time for a huge push to see how far we can get and how radical we can be in this moment and shift this conversation in a definitive way. Just a few months ago, the only climate debate in this election year was that mudslinging match between a government that bought a pipeline as part of its so-called climate strategy and a fossilized opposition over a totally inadequate carbon tax. The people pretending to do something versus the people who are done with even pretending. And then in just a few short months, Movements have come together to inject the Green New Deal into the election conversation, and students are walking out of class in the hundreds of thousands. And now we have, all of a sudden, we have two federal parties who are competing to claim the mantle of climate transformation, which is pretty significant. Neither of them are there yet, but they're, they're moving. Sven Robinson, who's here tonight, has been energetically pushing the NDP to the eco-left. Faster, please, Sven. 
Cities and towns are declaring climate emergencies, like the climate emergency plan uh, passed recently here in Vancouver, thanks to the effort of a new city councillor named Christine Boyle, who happens to be my sister-in-law, and was, and was a minister in this very church. There were more than 150 Green New Deal town halls organized across this land since the Pact for the Green New Deal was launched just last month. So this is all stunning progress. Of course, it's not nearly enough, not given the scope of transformation required, and not given the rising tide of right-wing racism and xenophobia surging to fill the political vacuum left by the liberals and their disastrous so-called pragmatism which means that we need to up our game right now and make this election year a true turning point. So, so I have decided to uh, try to provide a small public service tonight and get you ready for battle. Arm you with the facts and arguments to be Green New Deal ambassadors, if you're willing. Yes? Okay. Mobile persuasion units. Comfortable with that? Special envoys for the urgent transformation of late capitalism into a cooperative commonwealth of climate safety and stability. Yes? And solidarity? Okay. All right. I want you to leave, I honestly want you to leave tonight feeling ready to go door to door, like the R time folks are asking, uh, or explain to a friend exactly why the Green New Deal has you excited. So to that end, I would like to share to you the LEAP's top five reasons why the Green New Deal is workable, winnable, and the idea that we need right now. Ready? Let's do it. Reason number one. The Green New Deal will be a massive job creator, swell the ranks of unions, and increase workers' rights for all, especially the most vulnerable. We know that investments in renewable energy create many more jobs than investments in fossil fuels, up to 24 more times uh, for every dollar invested. But it's when you start thinking about the rest of the low carbon economy, green jobs that never get counted as such, like in healthcare, like in education, like in land and water defense, and other forms of low carbon care work, the job creation potential is spectacular. Just imagine the possible programs that would make up a Green New Deal, like retrofitting every building in Canada in a decade, building hundreds of thousands of new units of public and non-market housing, planting hundreds of millions of trees, building free mass transit in every community, universal daycare, reinvesting in education with thousands of new teachers to lower class sizes. We are talking about creating millions of family supporting jobs. So while we're embarking on the greatest job creation program in history, why would we not simply make it a goal to double the unionization rate in Canada and extend collective bargaining rights and protections to all those millions of workers who don't already have it? Why wouldn't we do that? How about a federal jobs guarantee with at least a $15 minimum wage as well as decent benefits and holidays and pensions? A federal jobs guarantee with those basic worker protections would set a floor that would completely change the dynamic between all workers and employers. Because if your fast food or temp agency employer knows that you can walk out the door and into dignified work at a living wage anytime, they'll have to think twice before splitting your shifts or stiffing you on your overtime or denying you the right to go home when you have a family crisis. The state of exploitation and fear and precariousness that characterizes working life for far too many today. So when some asshole tells you that the Green New Deal will hurt workers, I want you to set them straight and remind them that the Green New Deal is a job creation program of epic proportions and a tool to fight for working people across this land that will leave no worker behind. Reason number two, ignoring the climate crisis will bankrupt us, but the Green New Deal is our chance to create a much fairer economy than we have right now. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that report that changed everything last October, the economic damages of allowing global temperatures to rise by two degrees uh, Celsius would be $69 trillion. And we're headed for twice that level of warming at least. Now, of course, rolling out a Green New Deal would have huge costs as well, here at home, but also internationally. 
Because remember that Canada owes a climate debt to the parts of the world that did the least to create this crisis, but are suffering worse, first and worst. <laughs> Luckily, we have many financial tools available to us, ones that can generate the finance we need for a Green New Deal while attacking the untenable concentration of wealth in our economy. You know, for too long we've had climate policies that dumped the burden of paying for transition on those least responsible and those least able to pay, asking working people to accept higher daily costs while letting big polluters off the hook entirely. And that's happening in this country right now. And that's precisely why it's been so easy to stir up populist backlashes against carbon pricing, from France and the original Gilets Jaunes to Alberta uh, to Ontario. Moving forward, Fairness in climate financing must be non-negotiable, and it means the polluters have to pay. So that's the carbon majors that Harsha was talking about, the 100 state and fossil fuel giants responsible for a whopping 71% of greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. I understand that Harsha wants to shut them down tomorrow. I think we need their money first. I don't, know, I don't know whether Harsha would disagree. I have a feeling we might be, uh, we might be uh, in sync on this one. But we're also talking about the richest 10% of the world's population. A lot of the people in this room, uh, the world's richest 10% produce almost half of all global emissions today. So any climate policies that are going to be backlash proof have to reflect that reality. There are plenty to choose from. We need to increase royalties on extraction of all kinds. We need to get rid of all these absurd subsidies. We can sue those corporations for climate damages, uh, or maybe we could just do all of the above. But it's not just the fossil fuel companies who have put their own super profits ahead of the safety of our species for decades. So have the financial institutions that underwrote their investments in full knowledge of the risks. Canada's financial sector averages almost $50 billion a year in profit. And the vast majority of it is not reinvested in job creation in the productive economy. It's hoarded or gambled in the great electronic casinos of Bay Street and Wall Street. Just getting corporations to pay their existing tax bills to finance a Green New Deal would represent a vast rebalancing of our desperately unequal economy. There was this investigation by the Toronto Star and Corporate Knights uh, last year that found if Canada's top 100 corporations just paid their damn taxes at the actual tax rate, federal provincial tax rate, we'd have an extra $10 billion a year in public revenue each and every year. And then there's that other amount that we learned about from the parliamentary budget officer in the past few days, the amount that Canadian corporations are stashing in tax havens. $1.6 trillion left Canada for tax havens last year. And the amazing thing about the, what the PBO said is that you know, if 10% of that money that was stashed in offshore tax havens by Canadian corporations was to avoid taxes, it would generate $25 billion a year. $25 billion a year. Why do they put money in offshore tax havens again? To avoid their taxes. It's not 10%. It's got to be closer to 100% of that money. That money is being hoarded. So we can afford a Green New Deal as long as we have the courage to do what so many political parties, all political parties in this country, refuse to acknowledge, which is that we have to go where the money is. We need our money back, and we need it urgently. So, just keeping score, the Green New Deal is a job creation machine. Paying for it is entirely possible if we have the courage to pick a fight with the 1%. And you're up for that too. But it's not just about jobs and the economy, it is about justice. So here's reason number three for why we need a Green New Deal. This is our chance to defend life on Earth and indigenous land rights at the same time. And we've heard such powerful arguments for this already tonight. Let me just add one more. According to that comprehensive UN biodiversity report released last month that uh, David referred to at the beginning of the evening, we are at a critical turning point in the sixth mass extinction. There are a million animal and plant species at risk of extinction, more than at any other time in human history. And when the scientists become 
tragic poets, you know you're in trouble. That report said the essential interconnected web of life on Earth is getting smaller. The only hope is to engage in habitat restoration on a monumental scale, which of course would draw down a whole lot of carbon from the atmosphere, storing it in rehabilit rehabilitated forests and wetlands. Can it be done? We know it can be done. It's low tech. And the report in this place offers a fantastic sliver of hope. That report points out that a full quarter of the land on Earth is traditionally owned, managed, used, or occupied by indigenous peoples. And those territories, under intense pressure from industry, are also significantly better protected than lands under the control of settler societies, which is like, duh, indigenous people have been defending their lands for thousands of years. So for this reason, the UN report states that the knowledge, innovations, practices, institutions, and values of indigenous peoples are key to protecting the biodiverse systems on which all life depends. In other words, when we defend indigenous land rights, when we respect indigenous knowledge, we defend the health of the entire planet. <laughs> And that, my friends, is a profound gift because it means that when we rise to the climate crisis, we have a chance to redress and make reparations for the foundational and ongoing genocide that we have been talking about tonight. Not with more inquiries and empty apologies, but with the return of the land, which is what those crimes were always about in the first place. So a number of people have already made this, you know, done the, the quick checklist. I'm going to do it again. We need to know it. We need to go and read these documents, know what we're talking about when we say it, because these are the first step, in no way a full restoration, but the very first step we've got to implement, fully implement, and legislate the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, including the vital principle of free prior informed consent. We have the 94 calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And now we have the recommendations of the National Inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. So those are the very first steps. They are non-negotiable. They are the first things that a Green New Deal has to do, first, before anything else. And that's what it means to have a Green New Deal that puts justice and indigenous leadership at its center. So just keeping track, the Green New Deal delivers jobs, it delivers fairness in our economy, it delivers justice. Now let's start talking about why it's practical why this is within reach. Reason number four for why a Green New Deal is winnable. A Green New Deal can raise an army of supporters, which is handy because nothing less will do. So since its launch in the United States, the most frequent criticism of the Green New Deal is that its focus on economic and social justice is a liability. You've heard this argument. Why are you making climate action so much harder when you talk about all this justice and genocide and the economy and all this stuff? It, just make it about climate, okay? Just keep it about reducing emissions. That'll make it easier to win. This argument assumes that the social and economic justice pieces of the Green New Deal are weighing it down. In fact, they are precisely what's lifting it up. Unlike those technocratic climate movement 1.0 approaches that pass the costs of transition onto working people, the Green New Deal connects reducing pollution to the top priorities of the most vulnerable workers and the most excluded communities. As the climate justice movement has been arguing for many years now, when the communities with the most to gain from change lead the movement, they fight to win. So it turns out that the justice part of climate justice isn't just like morally right, the right thing to do. It's a winning strategy. It's how we win the broadest possible coalition because to change everything, we really do need everyone. So here's the fifth and final argument that I want to leave you with on the longest day of the year, which precedes the shortest night. This one is a little harder to quantify with facts and figures, but we're in a church, as has been pointed out a number of times, uh, on a weekend night, so I'm just gonna say it. 
the Green New Deal will be good for our souls. In fact, we may never have needed a collective project, a higher purpose, than we do right now. Let's be real. It's not just the planet's life support systems that are unraveling. So is our whole social fabric on so many fronts at once. The signs are all around us. The rise of fake news, of fascism and conspiracy, the hardening of the arteries of our body politic, the epidemics of despair, and the crisis of addiction. In the mass loneliness and alienation of late capitalism, lost in our algorithms of envy and anger, we are missing shared assumptions about what we can trust. We're missing shared assumptions about what is even real. And we're missing something more fundamental. As digitally connected as we are, we have never been so severed from the only web that truly matters, the web of interconnection in the fabric of life. So it's no surprise that the biggest obstacle to massive change in the face of climate breakdown is not climate denial, is not centrist jerk politicians, it's hopelessness. It's a feeling that we've all had, that it's too late, we left it too long, we can't get the job done on such a short timeline, and fundamentally that we're too selfish and greedy to do what's required. Isn't that the story that our entire economy is based on? That we're nothing more than a collection of atomized individuals and nuclear families unable to do anything together except maybe wage war. That view has had our society's imagination in a vice for a very long time, ever since Margaret Thatcher famously said, there is no such thing as a society. A common project on the scale of a Green New Deal could help restore that desperately needed sense of collective purpose. It's not a cure for racism or misogyny or homophobia or transphobia. We still have to fight all of those head on. But we could use a sense that we're working together for something bigger than ourselves, something that we are all part of creating, a feeling that I feel like we touched tonight in those moments when we connected in solidarity. And we need a sense that we're going somewhere together that is better than where we are right now. That's the healing we so badly need. In so many ways, we are talking about turning to each other and asking each other to take a leap of faith, to believe that we are capable of being more than we are right now. The Green New Deal reminds us that what is happening to you is happening to me, that our fates are intertwined. And its very emergence in this moment, for me, is proof that something's shifting. As surely as the glaciers are melting and the ice sheets are breaking apart, the solidity of that free market ideology is dissolving too. It is melting into air. And in its place, a new vision of what humanity can be is emerging. It's coming from the streets. It's coming from those schools with those beautiful students who are walking out. It's coming from workplaces. It's coming from unceded territory. It's a vision that says that all of us combined make up the fabric of society. And when the future of life is at stake, there is nothing that we can't achieve together. Am I right? So we are going to win a Green New Deal. We're going to win it because we have to. We're going to lead from below, and we're going to force our so-called leaders to follow, and we will build a safer, fairer future for the many and not the few. Thanks for coming, you guys. Thank you. Green New Deal! Green New Deal! Red, deal. Red New, New deal. deal! Brown New Deal! Rainbow New Deal! Green New Deal! Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Woo! Stay standing, everyone. I'd like to invite our speakers to stand if they can and if they're willing to come up here. And let's keep that energy going as we give them a huge round of appreciation. Thanks, Amy. And our incredible artist as well. Thank them for bringing their hearts and their wisdom. Anjali! <laughs>
Thanks, Abby. Free New Deal! <laughs> Thank you so much. Give yourselves a hand for making it to 10 p.m. Give our Art Time volunteers a hand for dancing and getting up here. Give our sponsors and partners a hand and check them out on your way out. Have a beautiful night and let's move forward together. Woo! Some people, check, check, check. Can 